Welcome, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I, as Cami just mentioned, did not go to Canterbury by my, myself, but uh, from my large family, I've been connected to this school for many years, and it's really nice to be able to come here and share uh, the, some of the things we're working on, and hopefully get you guys interested in working on the future, which is what we're doing now in all the universities across the country is looking at how do we do net zero housing, that is uh, net zero buildings, net zero uh, infrastructure. How do we uh, uh, design and build the next generation of houses to not only not use energy, but to produce more energy than it uses. And um, so uh, what I'm going to show you, uh, I'm not going to show you any of our work as a uh, as a practice, I'm going to show you the work I've been doing with students over the last few years um, with at Parsons, with uh, uh, our School of Management at the new school, and then also with some students and faculty from Stevens Institute of Technology. So um, we uh, uh, we were selected to be to compete in this year's Solar Decathlon. It's a biannual competition that has 20 different universities competing to design and build uh, net zero houses. And each team comes to the National Mall in uh, Washington, D.C. and brings a uh, uh, different concept for, for uh, their solar house. Um, so we're over here, this is our team right here, and our house is up there in the middle. And we just, uh, we just uh, uh, went through this competition uh, this October. So our team had a very particular approach to the competition. We decided if we're going to design and build an exhibition house, we want to be able to uh, do it in a way that can help community, and in particular to help Washington, D.C. If we're going to build a house and bring it down to Washington, we wanted to leave it there so we didn't have to uh, drive it back up to New York and waste more energy. And uh, so we ended up uh, uh, doing, uh, taking on a larger task than most of the teams. We decided to design a house that fit within the solar decathlon criteria. So it's a one-story uh, house that has one bedroom. And then we also decided that we would design and build uh, um, two single-family houses that are uh, semi-detached. Uh, in, in the neighborhood of Deanwood, which is in Washington, D.C. So this house is now becoming this house. This is the bottom floor of that, of that unit right there. And uh, so we, we exhibited it on the National Mall in October, and then we're now in the process of building out the, the rest of the project um, in Deanwood. So to do this project, it was uh, over two years with lots of students, 300 students, uh, ranging from architecture, engineering, fashion design, product design, um, communication design, and everyone had a role to play. We, uh, um, and, and we uh, interacted over the various years with uh, different courses, and then also during the summer periods, we had smaller groups getting together, uh, working in concentrated forms, uh, format all together. So it was very interdisciplinary. And uh, last summer was uh, an exciting time because uh, the, the students who had worked on the project actually built the house themselves. So they designed it and then they built it. And so this little narrowing part right here is where we were building. And this is where we are right now, where we're expanding out again. So we worked with this uh, neighborhood in DC called Deanwood. And in order to collaborate with them, we actually connected with various institutions, the DC Department of Housing and Community Development. So the DC government gave the land for the property. We are partnering with Habitat for Humanity. You guys all know Habitat. Yeah, right? Uh, Habitat is a great non-for-profit developer. Uh, it's the 10th largest developer in the United States, which was interesting to know that. Um, and the DC affiliate is, uh, is uh, essentially um, helping us to find the homeowner and, uh, and get the homeowner to live in this house. And then we also worked with community uh, leaders in the neighborhood. So we worked with Sylvia Brown, who was their ANC uh, director. 
So Deanwood is a um, really beautiful uh, part of Washington, D.C. It's east of the Anacostia River, so it's not near the mall. It's on the other side of the river from the mall. And it's always, um, it's a historically African-American community uh, that has always seen itself as be having to be self-reliant. Uh, the reason being because it's a small community in a city without a lot of representation, so they have to essentially make it on their own. So when we, when we approached them to build a net zero house, which allows this family to live more sustainably on their own, they were really excited about partnering with us. So um, this gives you a little picture of the kind of people who live in Deanwood. Marvin Gaye was, do you guys know Marvin Gaye? Yeah. All right, good, yeah. you. <laughs> he, he's from, uh, he's from Deanwood. Um, Lady Bird Johnson started the uh, City Beautiful movement in Deanwood. Um, and so here's the site that we are now building the house on. Uh, the back of the site is uh, quite beautiful because it, it um, backs up to a river parkway and, uh, uh, and is a green space. So what we did is uh, we tried to pick up on some of the qualities of Deanwood uh, and accentuate the porch. It's, there's a large porch culture in, in, in Deanwood. So one of the elements of our house is a large porch. The other thing that we did is uh, our, we needed to um, gather as much light as possible into the house because with, as a solar house, you need to use that solar energy. But interestingly enough, the site was oriented in such a way that our buildings had to be long and narrow. So the top part of that image is the south. And so it's the short side of the house. So what we ended up doing is um, adding a light loft to collect more light into the center of that long, narrow, narrow site. And then also the house opens up to the south, to the backyard and that, and that greenway that I explained to you. So, but more importantly, um, one of the major concepts that we worked with in this project is a notion of, um, of synergy, synergetic um, uh, interactions. So we were constantly coming up against the idea that yeah, this works better if it's together. And uh, it works, and that concept works in terms of the building. So when we build one house and it sits by itself, and you have a lot of surface area that has to confront the environment, it's harder to make it be, uh, have the right around insulation to stop the energy flows. But if you put two houses together, you save more energy. So two houses are better than one. Working with, uh, working with, uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples of how our, we, uh, tied together some of our energy systems so that we took advantage of the waste heat that is um, uh, outputted from uh, one system to another. So it's always seeing how things interact. So here are some photos. This is the, the you can't uh, turn these off, huh? Rob? Just thinking it would be nice to be able to actually. Sorry, thanks. Um, here are photos of, of what the house looked like on the mall. Um, the large porch that I was talking about, it became a, a real hangout place for people in, uh, down in D.C. And then the large porch to the back that is uh, now going to be opening up to the park. Um, we, we used very simple materials, but one of the main materials we used was uh, cedar siding, so that front porch is uh, unfinished cedar siding, which makes it have a wonderful smell, but also it will age very beautifully. Um, and this is what the house is going to look like when it gets to Deanwood. So we're going to add a second floor and then add that, add that other unit. And um, one of the most exciting parts about the project for everyone was that we, uh, in working with Habitat for Humanity, um, we have uh, Habitat was able to find a homeowner candidate. So Lakia Kuli is the woman who is going to live in this house with her three sons. And they came and visited the house when we were on the mall. It was really 
a wonderful moment for us and our team. Yeah. Is it two separate families living in? There will be another family who's going to be living in the other house. Uh, that, that's not yet built, and I'll show you the pictures of that. Um, and what, what Habitat does is they, they advertise right before the house is done for homeowners. So this... No, I mean, I mean the, mm -hmm. the one that you just were showing, like, there's, yeah. there's two doors on it. Is, is that, yeah, that okay, this is, this is one house, right, with the one door. And whoop, this is that one house, and you're right, there's a, ne a second house with the second door. So there'll be two houses, families living side by side, which is uh, typical in this area to do uh, slightly denser housing. And again, we had to build the first one, uh, first part of this house as a module because of the constraints of the competition. And that's, there's our students on the left building it. We figured if, if we could do it, anyone can do it, right? And here's Lakia on the mall. Um, uh, uh, really excited to be part of the whole project. So I wanted to tell you a little bit, get into a little bit about how we did what we did, which is how do you take a building, like the building that you guys are in right here, and make it not use any, any energy, rather make it produce more energy? And how do you do it affordably? That was our main mission because we're working with Habitat for Humanity. We want to make sure we can do this. Uh, you may know that um, it's possible to do net zero houses and buildings, right? Do you guys know about this? Heard a little about it. You heard some about uh, geothermal last week, right? Yeah. But what's real, what is uh, the next generation is to do it affordably in a way that doesn't um, require any more means than a typical building. So how did we do it? We, we did it um, with using a couple different strategies. But the first one was working passively. So working with the build, what we call the building envelope and designing that building envelope so that it performs optimally as it interacts with the environment. Um, and there's some very simple strategies that you use. First of all, the first thing you do is you Make sure your building is really well insulated. You know when you're walking outside that if you put on a winter coat that has a lot of down in it, that you're a lot warmer. It's the same principle with the house. And in addition to that, the other thing we do is we control how the air moves in and out of the house. If you've ever been in an old house that has uh, old windows, and um, it is drafty because there's lots of leaks of air moving through the wall. It's not the best way to design a house. It's much better to create, uh, make sure that envelope is what's called airtight. Oops. Um, and then provide a ventilation system for the building. So the building actually works very much like a body, like a human being, where you have your insulation, which is for our body. What is our insulation? Skin, no. Yeah. <laughs> the fat. And uh, um, the, the, the other thing that we, we do, though, is we breathe. So this house has a ventilator that allows it to breathe. And in breathing, it actually has better indoor air quality than the normal houses, because you're not pushing mold through the walls, which or some, many of you have, have experienced the smell of an old house that's very moldy. Well, it's because air is moving through the wall and creating mold. Um, and then the last thing that we did, which is extremely important, is that we took advantage of the sun. And uh, I'll show you a little later how we uh, uh, positioned windows and overhangs to make sure that we optimized solar gain during the winter and reduced it during the summer. So. Um, this uh, sketch shows you um, the, the red cut is the wall, and what's interesting about that is that you can see that those walls are thicker than normal houses, and they're thicker because we're using more insulation than more n normal houses. Um, so to do this, we used various 
uh, energy modeling programs, uh, we worked with a system called Passive House Planning Package. And so in this modeling program, you actually test everything. Like you put in all of the variables of the house to, to make sure that you can predict what's going to happen. And one of the interesting things is if you look at that right here, 4.36 4 uh, kBTU per square foot annual. That's, that number, kBTU per square foot annual, is a little bit like miles uh, per gallon of your car, right? That's how we're going to start measuring houses in the future. What kind of, what is the number it makes with the um, kBTU, kilowatt BTU per square foot for the whole year, right? And our house ends up using 90% um, less energy than normal. So if you look at the normal houses, uh, what, how much energy they would, would they use if it's 90% more? Anybody? What? Um, okay, if we have, we're using 4.36 kilobtus per square foot annually, okay? And most houses use 90% more. So how much energy do most houses use? Anybody? Uh, around. Around. 7.6. No more, more. Yeah. Eight. No more. It's a factor of 10. So 90, almost 100. So it's almost 53 kBTU per square foot annual versus 4.36, right? So um, that is a huge uh, part of why this house is affordable. If we can, in the building envelope, use insulation, which is really cheap. Insulation is uh, the cheapest building material possible. Uh, to get the load down by 10 times the amount of normal houses, you, you can make some net zero houses really easily. And our engineering students use these really fancy modeling programs to analyze all of the wall sections. And it was really fun working back and forth between the architects and engineers to um, um, optimize the building. And uh, we had to do things like size uh, all of the building envelope, how much insulation, how much uh, wall area, et cetera. And our students also got kind of fancy because that modeling program was uh, an Excel program, so it wasn't very visual. So our students actually created a way to interact with that program and make it visual. And um, that was also really helpful in terms of the process. Oops. So I'm not going to show you, uh, that was the design phase of it and the concepts, but what I want to show you quickly is uh, our building of it. We were really lucky because we are working with Stevens Institute of Technology and they had a waterfront site where we got to build the house. So we were sitting on the Hudson River looking over at the Freedom Tower as it was going up and we were having a competition who would, who would be done first. We won. <laughs> so, and we had to go through a flood. Do you guys remember the flood this summer? We had to, oh, it was crazy. So here's, here's what are called wall sections for those of you guys who are studying architecture. Uh, this is the kind of drawings we do to figure out how to build it. And it's a cut through the floor, the wall, and the roof. And again, what that shows, if you saw, compared that to a normal house, is this wall is much thicker. It's about 13, 14 inches thick versus maybe 6 inches thick for a normal house. And here's our students and some of our um, consultants on the job site. We had a couple students spend about a month putting all the insulation into those thick walls and uh, they were constantly covered with dust. But it was fun. And then the other thing I want to show you about the house is um, our windows because I've talked a lot about insulation. Um, the insulation we used, by the way, was called cellulose. Do you guys, does anyone know what cellulose is made out of? Guess? I, I could sort of hear, but not. Sugar, no. 
close in a way. It's a recycled material, and it's it's uh it's everywhere. Plastic. No, we're not using plastic. Air, air is a really big part of it, because without air you don't have insulation. But it's black and white and red all over. There you go. We, our insulation was just chopped up newspaper, so it's it's awesome. Uh, recycled doesn't have any of the off gassing of the plastic insulations. And, and cheap. So our windows, though, our windows were really awesome. And that's, that made a huge difference in our house. We use what are called triple glazed windows. You guys probably, a lot of houses used to be made out of single glaze. The build, this building probably has a double glaze. We use triple glaze. That means it has three layers of glass and a almost vacuum in between the layers of glass. And our, gla our, our glass gets a very high insulated quality, so it doesn't have much heat transfer. And what's interesting about that, if you can get windows to perform that well, is that they can actually begin to be a net benefit for the house versus the opposite, which is normally in houses up until now, windows are where all the energy is lost. But now, because these windows are so well designed, we can gather all the sun during the winter, or winter and it becomes a net positive, which is really exciting. And we also did some things for daylighting. In the interior of our house, um, it was very well daylit. We won the award for lighting uh, in the competition. Uh, but one of the things they did, because we took this thick wall and we chamfered it so that light could bounce into the space and there wouldn't be so much glare. And it's sort of like an old uh, medieval cathedral. Uh, it's kind of fun to work with the thick walls. Here's some more wall sections showing that detail. And here's our student putting it all together. So he figured, he devised, Steve devised a really interesting way to insert that window. Oh, come on. And here's more photographs of the interior. You can see the light loft on the right there and the kitchen. So then the next thing we did is, all right, we did all this stuff passively and, it, and we got our energy loads way down. And the next thing we did is uh, we designed a very efficient micro mechanical system. So our mechanical system is very small compared to most houses. And it's made up of three elements and uh, uh, air handler, a ventilator and a hot water machine. And what's interesting again is that we were able to couple these things uh, together so that they made more sense. <coughs> so for instance, our hot water heater, it, is, um, it works better if, if there's heat around it. So if the temperature around the hot water heater is warmer, it works better. So what we ended up doing is taking the exhaust from our dryer and pulling that air over to our hot water heater so when the dryer is on, the hot water works better. So uh, again, being able to reduce the size of the system. And we also had really fancy controls. Uh, so um, the homeowner can uh, you know, uh, or run their house from their iPad. Yeah. Did you ever consider doing a geothermal? No, no. I, I, it, no. Okay. There's a few reasons why, actually. Um, what, one is because we had to transport this house. So it's, um, and it had to be displayed on the mall where we could not touch that ground. So it was, number one, we can't use it. Um, if we did use it, our geothermal system would be very small. It would just be one little loop. Um, and there are houses that, that are made to the standard that use that, but again, because of how we had the constraints that we were set up with, we couldn't do it. And it, it was fine, because we're still, um, we still had the smallest renewable energy system on the mall. We won affordability, so our students were really excited. And the reason we won is because our PV system was uh, 4.2K, I think, 4.5 kilowatts. Um, the next uh, house in the solar decathlon, their systems were 10K. So we were half the size of all the other houses in terms of our 
energy system. So we didn't really need the geothermal. And actually also, every climate is slightly different. So in, in DC, it's a hot, humid climate. And so getting the humidity out is really the problem. And geothermal doesn't help much with that, that problem. So we used equipment that could be more efficient at dealing with the type of climate that we were working with, which in our case was a, it's a, called a heat pump. Uh, or a mini split is the name of it. And, and, and again, we want affordability. The homeowner gets to uh, save about $2,300 a year on her energy cost. Over time, that could be up to, depending on the cost of energy, anywhere between, on her 30-year mortgage, anywhere between fifty dollars and $250,000 worth of money. And for them, that's a college education, so it's really important. And it pays back um, in a very short amount of time, eight years. We did a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Um, we realized that if you're going to build a home and you want it to be net zero, you need a community to help support it. So we uh, worked with the city to develop a, a zero water runoff garden, which I won't go into in any in detail. But one of the exciting things is we're actually collecting public water onto our site and we're demonstrating to the to the city of DC that we can slow down the water and that's the the rainwater that comes and if we can uh, show that that uh, the rest of Washington DC will begin to use this and it will save a tremendous amount of money through uh, the sewage in infrastructure which is right now overwhelmed uh, with the uh, storm water runs off so that, that's exciting but we also outfitted the house so they could grow their own food. And uh, um, so compost, cistern, um, et cetera. And we uh, worked with the community to build a community garden uh, three blocks away where they're doing trainings for the community and outreach, uh, both in terms of how to grow your own food. Because if you haven't done it before, there's a little bit of a learning curve. But also, um, we started a solar co-op for the neighborhood so that other people in the, in the neighborhood could actually start um, doing things because there's a lot of opportunities there that most people don't know about and we're helping to uh, share that. Very exciting. Uh, we uh, went from the competition to the site and the house was moved by, by a truck onto the, our foundations. It was a dramatic couple of days. And this slide came to us uh, from Habitat last week. They just started to frame the second floor. Um, so these two houses should be done by the end of this summer. And Lakia will be able to move in. And we're really excited about that. So I wanted to um, stop by showing you guys a little video that was on USA Today, uh, which interviews Lakia so you can in their house hear from her. I don't know. Oops, I probably didn't, shouldn't have done that. Carson's approached us um, with the pretty novel idea that, hey, you know, the solar can pass on and that's been going on every other year for about eight, ten years now. Um, and these homes are dismantled and, and never actually lived in. How about, you know, we work together to actually put a family into this home. They are giving it to a low-income family in Ward 7 in Deanwood of Washington, D.C. So that was just a really win-win situation where they, they design a house for a competition and then instead of taking it home, they're living it here in Washington, D.C. Deanwood has a very tight-knit community with great leaders who are interested in um, these issues. We're contributing to their efforts. We're not starting them, uh, which I think is really important. The house will be half of a two-unit duplex once it is moved to the northeast quadrant of the city. Building a duplex, we're actually creating a more efficient building because there's less surface area for dwelling that's exposed. Um, and we will be certified as passive house uh, once we get to the Dima neighborhood, which is the highest energy efficiency standard in housing today. This will be the very first passive solar home that Habitat has built in Washington, D.C. Here's the kids. The family chosen by Habitat came to see their future home for the first time. Lakia Colley, she's a single mother. She works as an administrative support staff person at the Department of State. She has three children. One of them is an infant, just about five months old, I think. 
and they were already living in the Deanwood neighborhood and have been wanting to stay. So in that respect, it was an ideal time. I felt excited and overwhelmed at the same time to know that I was the one who was able to get the first solar house in D.C. It's exciting. It's like history in the making, and I'm a part of it. Another remarkable thing about the House of Solar Homes um, is that they are much more sustainable for the lower income families who serve, just, meaning that because the cost to heat and how... I just wanted you to hear her uh, uh, words. She, uh, you know, she, she, she was also saying at other times, um, you know, that uh, her neighbors are like, "Hey, what do you mean you're not going to have any any energy bills? Uh, how do I get one of those?" So, um, it's it's really exciting. Where you know we've we've uh, we've, we've um, brought together a bunch of people to work on something that's pretty straightforward and simple, and the hope is that. Likia will have a great life in that house, but other people will begin to be able to do similar things. So I wanted to stop there and open it up for questions. I'm sorry I was like excited and kept going. Any, any questions? More questions? More detailed questions about systems? I'm happy to. Yeah. The outside is cedar, exactly. How would it hold up against like a, a house fire? Uh, well, the walls are, are fire rated, so um, the cedar is not the fire rated material. Behind it, there are, are uh, gypsum materials that stop fire from for two hours, essentially. Good question. Yeah. All right, suppose I want to start a new house. So would it be more cost effective to build a house and add geothermal or just go with any type of one of those type uh, this. <laughs> Ge geothermal is really great for retrofit, actually, because this is not better. It's, it's more expensive if you want to renovate your house right now to do it this way. Yeah? How much does the house like this cost? That's a good question. Um, this house costs $250,000. And in D.C., that is comparable to what Habitat for Humanity has been doing. So it's a little more expensive, not a lot. It's 15% uh, more expensive. And again, one of the slides we were showing uh, shows that that 15%, depending on the cost of energy, will take about eight years to, for habitat to recoup if they didn't get any subsidies. But there are, there are sub state subsidies. So it, right now, it's actually probably the same cost as a normal house. Yeah. How long does it take to pay for itself? Eight years. Eight years. Right now, with today's energy costs and with the construction costs of the current market. Okay. Eight, years. Eight years. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you guys um, come up with funding to build things? That's a really good question. All the students helped. We, we, whoa, yeah. Where do we come up with the funding? Uh, the project was expensive not to build the house. The house was the cheapest part of the whole project. It was gathering all the people together, getting the meetings, uh, and um, traveling, et cetera. And so what was really great is that the students did a tremendous job reaching out to different sponsors. Um, and w what was really interesting is the sponsors were, we had tremendous uh, response and um, had great, great support. So. Jones Lang LaSalle, MetLife, um, oh gosh, um, and, uh, the, you know the Mystics? You guys know the basketball team? The women's basketball team down in DC? She, uh, she supported the project. A bunch of people gave us money, and then we, all of the, many of the building materials were supplied at cost. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was really one of the biggest efforts that we had was to raise money. Yeah. 20. 20. Yeah. So next year they're going to do it again. So every two years they've been doing this. And uh, uh, for the, they've been doing this for 10 years. And it's always been in D.C. up until now. But the next version will probably be in another city. Could be Chicago, could be L.A. Well, you guys sign on, so every time you build a house now, for the next couple years, you guys going to get that. <coughs> 
we are, we, this has led us to have other partnerships with Habitat. And so we are working on the next project right now. We're going to continue to help DC, but we're working with Habitat for Humanity of Philadelphia to do uh, uh, another project in, along a similar time frame. So we're not entering the decathlon again because we have too much to complete right now. But Hmm? What? When are you guys coming to Boston? Boston? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be cool. Any other questions? Yeah. How do your uh, grad students, uh, your courses that teach your grad students how to like, construction techniques? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that chart that I showed had all those courses on it. We have different kinds of courses. So we have we have you know basic. You need to know the basics. So there is some physics courses that, that our students take. And then there's building construction technology. And then there's design and engineering. And so we scheduled it in such a way that those students who had already taken those preliminary cat classes could do this as advanced research, essentially. Yeah. No, it's mixed. We had, we had undergrad and grad working together. Okay. Any other questions? 